So, welcome to the fifth Casaleño lectures. As usual, uh, you do the lecture first, and then uh, we have the discussion. Thank you, Elisa. So we have um, air conditioning today. I was, uh, hope everyone will be more comfortable. Uh, okay, I'm going to uh, start today with some general remarks about dispositional properties and their relation to conditionals and to the projection strategy that I talked about on Wednesday, sort of really expanding on um, one of the uh, examples of the idea of the, the projection strategy, namely the Goodman's uh, way of thinking about uh, dispositional predicates. Uh, then, uh, after sort of looking a, in a little bit more detail at the general issue, I go back to the game and decision theory models that I talked a little bit about, uh, sketched really, I didn't really define the models, but um, uh, sets the, the, the idea of a kind of model of a game, um, uh, a model of a sequence of, of decisions. Uh, and um, in this context, see a little bit uh, more um, specific reflection of some of the general uh, issues, particularly uh, the idea of uh, the game theoretic notion of a strategy and Think, a way of thinking of a strategy as a uh, complex uh, dispositional property. Uh, and the general hope is, uh, I mean, I, don't, I was saying, I, I don't have a, a big constructive uniform picture uh, to offer in defense of um, a way of thinking metaphysically about uh, natural necessity so much as a family of strategies for trying to uh, get clearer about some of the connections between some of these different notions. And so part of, uh, part of my motivation here uh, is to say um, there's some very specific problems about um, practical reasoning and also some very specific problems in epistemology about inductive reasoning. Uh, and um, these specific issues, um, it helps to illuminate them, to connect them together with some more abstract metaphysical issues concerning the nature of natural necessity. So we'll see something about how going back and forth between these kinds of formal models one gets of of different kinds and trying to see how they can be put together, one can uh, at least bring out some, um, some um, um, uh, we hope some illumination, but in some cases just a matter of articulating and clarifying uh, where the problems are. Okay, so dispositions and conditionals. A dispositional property generally is a property that's understood in terms of the way it manifests itself under certain uh, conditions. So the disposition of an object uh, is directly, uh, closely related to two other properties. So you think of a dispositional property as a monadic property of something, the thing that has the dispositional property. Um, and the two other properties are a manifestation condition and a test condition. However, one analyzes the relationship between these uh, three uh, properties, uh, whether when, so, uh, one of them can be analyzed in terms of the others and so on, uh, whatever one thinks about that, or everyone sort of thinks of the nature of dispositions as being characterized in terms of the, uh, these, um, these three kinds of um, properties. So a glass, is fragile if it would shatter if dropped, uh, roughly speaking. Uh, it would tend to um, um, shatter if dropped. Um, it would be, uh, it would bend. Uh, if, it, if, it, if it's flexible, then if it were uh, subjected to suitable pressure, it would bend. Um, 
uh, it's soluble in water if um, uh, it would dissolve if put in water. It's observable if it can be seen by a suitable observer under suitable lighting conditions. These are very, uh, in most cases, somewhat vague characterizations of a property. Uh, what are suitable conditions and so on, but, um, but uh, one generally understands dispositions in terms of uh, things that manifest themselves under certain specific um, conditions. The examples I give are very different both in, in how vague or specific they are and also how much they're just sort of common sense um, characterizations of a fairly superficial kind of property or whether they're themselves theoretically loaded. So um, soluble is a kind of paradigm people sometimes talk about, but uh, it's a technical scientific notion. Um, it's not dissolving, is not simply a superficial observable property. It's, um, it's a particular kind of uh, physical chemical process. Um, uh, and so the very notion of dissolving and, and, uh, and solubility um, are um, connected to a theory. But many of the others, you begin with a kind of rough characterization of the way a thing behaves. In, uh, in that, and that's a kind of primitive start on getting kind of theoretical understanding of a process uh, of, that's going on. In the old philosophy of science literature from the logical empiricist days in the 30s and 40s, dispositions were regarded as the simplest kind of theoretical term. The general problem was how do we explain unobservable entities and theoretical concepts in terms of observation, observable properties and observable concepts. So the idea is that manifestation conditions are observable properties, although as we'll see, that's not always the case. Uh, in the more, more abstract consideration. But um, um, so uh, since one can't just sort of look at a thing and tell that it's fragile, um, unless one has a th theoretical um, understanding of what kinds of things are fragile. Um, so, but it's a fairly superficial problem or a property none, nonetheless. So the idea was that if we have difficulty even in explaining dispositional properties in terms of observation, then uh, how are we going to ever understand more uh, highly theoretical notions? So the, um, uh, the starting point, particularly with Carnap, who had a theory about dispositional uh, properties and a way of trying to give them partial analyses. Um, um, uh, this really is the origin of, of the problem. But the problem takes on a life of its own beyond the, um, the positivist uh, time. Um, now, It was thought in this early discussion that if we could only understand counterfactuals, then we could define dispositional properties in terms of counterfactuals, simply by saying that the property of being flexible was simply to be defined as the counterfactual property of being such that if it were subjected to suitable pressure, it would um, bend. Um, And uh, um, so, I mean, that's one of the motivations that Goodman had for looking for an analysis of counterfactuals. But uh, it was taken for granted that, well, if we could do that, that would solve uh, this uh, problem. But, um, uh, but then we can't find an analysis of counterfactuals, Goodman argued. Um, so it, uh, the simple pattern, as I said, of uh, um, analysis would be, of dispositions in terms of counterfactuals would be, uh, if it passes the test condition, if it had passed the test condition, uh, 
it would pass the manifestation condition, something that would be counterfactual in some contexts and not, not counterfactual in others. So an object is flexible if only it would uh, be subjected to suitable, um, would bend if subjected to suitable pressure. Um, but then it was argued in a classic paper by, which uh, was very influential by C.B. Martin, that this simple analysis of dispositions in terms of counterfactual won't work anyway. And this led to an extensive literature about what came to be called Finkish dispositions. So Martin's example, a contrived example, but um, there are other situations that might be less obvious but more natural of this, this kind of thing, um, was what he called an electrofink. So um, uh, an electrofink is a device that connects to, uh, when, when, it's, uh, when it detects a live wire, um, that a live wire is about to be touched by a conductor, um, then under uh, that condition, instantly it causes the wire to become dead. So you have a li live wire, you connect an electrofink to it, and it's kind of a protective device, so that if ever a conductor were to come close to the live wire, uh, it would immediately shut the electricity off. So um, the property of being live in, with respect to an electrical wire is a dispositional property where the test condition is being touched by a conductor and the manifestation condition is current flowing from the wire to the conductor. The live wire remains live when, connected, when con connected to the electrofink, but it no longer has the counterfactual property. So the idea is it retains its dispositional property. You don't change anything about the property of the wire. It's still a live wire. There's still electricity in it. Um, but uh, it's not, it doesn't have the property being such that current would flow from the wire if touched by the conductor, because um, being touched by the conductor would have, by the time the conductor got there, have turned off um, the current because of the electrofink. The potential gap between counterfactual um, pre uh, predicates and dispositional predicates was anticipated in a less um, um, in a simpler, straightforward way by, uh, by Goodman who gave a simple example of an object which is inflammable even though it would not burn if heated. And the reason it would not burn if heated is because it's in an oxygen-free environment. Now, the general lesson that Goodman uh, drew was that, to, uh, as he put it, quote, to speak very loosely, the dispositional statement says something exclusively about the internal state of W, the object, uh, while our original counterfactual, um, if it were, um, 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 if it were heated, it would burn, um, uh, is a more general property about the overall um, situation. So the idea is um, a counterfactual makes a claim about an uh, overall situation, whereas a disposition is supposed to make a claim about a specific, normally, not always, but an intrinsic property of, uh, of the object. Um, Okay, so while the original counterfactual says something additional uh, about the surrounding circumstances. So it was in this context that uh, making this point that Goodman uh, remarked, remark I noted uh, on Wednesday, that the problem of dispositions is uh, perhaps um, uh, the problem of dispositions is really simpler than the problem of counterfactuals. And that we should perhaps approach um, the former problem first. But this way of approaching the pro uh, Goodman's way of approaching the problem of dispositions was not, um, uh, as he attempted to do with counterfactuals, to look 
to a reductive, for a reductive analysis in general of dispositions in terms of the test condition and the manifestation condition, but uh, rather to um, um, instead um, to link um, this kind of conceptual problem, the problem of explaining these concepts that go beyond observable concepts, uh, by linking them um, um, to, um, to the problem of induction, um, to the methods we used, as I said last time, we, talk, we talked about that the, you, um, you um, um, have the problem of inferring, the problem of induction put in a very simple-minded way, but the problem of inferring from observation to things not yet observed, uh, analogous to the problem of inferring conceptually, uh, extending a property from things that are, are subject to a test condition to things that aren't subject, perhaps not subject to the test condition. Um, so it's basically the idea of trying to say, well, we got the problem of induction anyway, and all the various ways of thinking about our inductive reasoning, and, and uh, even though we can't solve the problem of induction on Hume's terms, what we can do is give a kind of account of what we're doing when we do induction and the uh, descriptive procedures we find by solving this very general problem of epistemology can be applied to understanding how we project uh, conceptually to get dispositions. So that was, that was the idea and that's the projection strategy. Um, so the picture to quote from Goodman, the way he thought of it. Uh, this is a quotation in the middle of the first, uh, toward the end of the first page of the handout. Flexes and fails to flex are mutually exclusive, and together they exhaust the realm of things that are under suitable pressure. But neither uh, applies to anything, neither flexes nor fails to flex, applies to anything that is outside of this realm. If it's not subject to suitable pressure, it doesn't fail to flex, whatever it is. So thus, uh, from the fact that flexes does not apply to a thing that uh, we cannot in general infer that fails to flex does apply. Within the realm of things under suitable pressure, however, the two predicates not only affect a dichotomy, but coincide exactly with flexible and inflexible. Again, idealizing a bit with uh, odd cases where, where things behave in abnormal ways. Uh, so uh, it's a, when the dispositional predicate, what the dispositional predicate does, again, still quoting Goodman, is, so, uh, so to speak, to project this dichotomy uh, to a wider class of things. And a predicate like flexible may thus be regarded as an expansion or projection of the predicate flexes. So that's the picture. What is the basis for this projection or extension of the application of the predicate to the wider domain? Can one, uh, and the idea is one uses exactly the same principles that one uses to make predictions about the future, uh, or more generally, from the unobserved to the unobserved. So again, no analysis here, just um, a, a, a uh, saying we have some general methods uh, of solving a certain problem and we can extend those methods to a different problem. So again, as we did, we contrasted the projection strategy with the reduction strategy that guided Goodman's original project uh, and that also guided David Lewis's approach uh, to counterfactuals that we talked about. Dispositional predicates are taken as primitive and Goodman would have insisted we don't have partial definitions, even though in the sense there is a kind of partial definition here. Uh, we have to take those as postulates and introduce uh, just new primitives, but justify the introduction of those primitives by the way we use inductive procedure to tell that they are, that they are present. Um, so there, uh, uh, the, the project um, uh, is to explain how we can how we can have evidence uh, 
uh, about their exemplifications, that is, about the presence of a dispositional property. They are like the objective properties that De Finetti uh, explained, uh, although De Finetti didn't believe in such properties, but he provided the resources for applying the projection strategy to the concept of objective chance. You can't observe objective chance, but the uh, conceptual connection between chance and subjective probability that's brought out by, uh, by De Finetti's mathematical result um, explains how one can have evidence based on observation, namely on the actual flips of the coin, whether they come up heads or tails on particular flips, how those can be seen as some kind, a kind of manifestation of the disposition, which gives you not certainty, but probability of a very, in a very precise way, uh, um, the hypothesis that some chance uh, property is present, that the coin has a bias of two-thirds, can, uh, can be confirmed to as high a degree as you like if, as you gather more and more evidence. And that's a sort of a, a corollary of the, of the theorem that he proves, that you will get confirmation of these, uh, uh, of these uh, empirical hypotheses about dispositional uh, properties. Um, so the, then if, if we can vindicate dispositional properties in this way, then they'll be available as a resource for characterizing the relevant notion of comparative similarity or minimal difference that will give us a substantial account of counterfactual dependence but they also rely on uh, an implicit hypothesis about independence. So that's why they're not, um, they're not reductive. So it's essential that, I mean, the idea of a disposition is that the, um, the test condition, whether it's the thing is put under pressure or not, um, that's a sort of local property of a, that an object has at a certain moment and that having that property or not is under normal conditions counterfactually independent or causally independent of whether the disposition is there. So that's why the, the Finkish idea is an idea we can artificially introduce a counterexample to the independence, but the independence is still playing a central role in the uh, theory because um, uh, the reason uh, it has the disposition is that normally you don't take dispositions away when you put something under the counterfactual conditions. Now Goodman was a minimalist who is happy uh, about a, a skeptic about intentional uh, notions such as properties and relations. Um, but he was happy enough to talk about predicates and their extensions and not, but not about uh, properties. But this is a hang up that we can uh, separate from his projection strategy for explaining dispositions. So one who's more friendly to properties might put the point this way. We find a distinction, things shatter or they don't, that is manifested under a certain test condition uh, when they get dropped. We hypothesize that there exists a property that coincides with the display property normally under whenever the test condition is met, but that things have or lack independently of whether they satisfy the test condition. Um, the test and manifestation conditions are then used to fix the reference of the hypothesized property. So it's the, it's the property, if there is one, which explains why things shatter when they break. Now, the hypothesis is an empirical one, as reference-fixing um, stipulations always have an empirical um, presupposition if they're empirical. Um, um, and uh, this attempt to, to fix the reference uh, may fail. As we saw, we talked a little bit the other time about the, pr uh, the alleged or uh, hypothetical um, hypothesized property of being lucky that a person might have. And uh, the idea that really the empirical hypothesis is there is some feature of the person that have independent of their uh, 
uh, engaging in chance uh, events like buying lottery tickets, which lead them to be successful. It's like having a, buy, a, a chance, a greater chance of winning if you're a lucky person. But the hypothesis that there is such a property is not um, borne out because if, if the hypothesis were correct, then you can assume that you would be able to find other properties that tend to correlate with it empirically. Uh, and uh, so then that would give rise to further ways of establishing that the property is present. And uh, it would lead to sort of theoretical building on the hypothesis that the property exists or is, is, is instantiated. Uh, when you try that, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it leads uh, uh, theory, but it's not, uh, it, it's not, there's no algorithm for telling when it works. It's a matter of, of uh, making empirical hypotheses, drawing, um, uh, putting them together with other theoretical hypotheses that you are inclined to accept and drawing conclusions from them and either getting things confirmed or, or disconfirmed. Um, so a very general way of thinking about the intuitive picture here is something like this. If we look at just the surface of things, just, just try to be extremely descriptive about what you see in the world without any theoretical assumptions at all, what you will find is a seemingly chaotic sequence of events as things interact with each other. Um, the theorist hypothesizes that the things that are interacting have certain underlying, more stable, persisting properties, even though everything keeps changing in the world as we look at, uh, at things, and um, that, that there are certain properties, perhaps underlying and unobservable properties, which persist through this and help to explain why the interactions, chaotic uh, interactions are as they are. Um, so there are properties that are more stable and independent than the overt behavior of the interacting things would suggest. When two or more things interact, the behavior that's manifested will depend on the underlying dispositional properties of all of the things. And the test conditions for the dispositions of one thing might make reference to the dispositional properties of other things. Uh, in particular the, with the things they interact with. Um, so to use a familiar kind of example, a key is disposed to open a certain kind of lock. What kind of lock? The kind that is disposed to open when uh, oh, by that key. Now this, is, this particular description of the dispositions is entirely circular, but um, but it nevertheless is correct in terms of identifying a feature of the lock which, is, it, which it has independently of the existence of the key, although of course since it's an artifact it was designed to fit uh, the key, but the actual physical uh, uh, base of the disposition is something the lock has independently of the properties that the key had. It's because of the relationships between the two more stable disposition properties that they tend to interact as, as, uh, as they do. Now it's obvious there's no analysis here, but there is a, a non-trivial hypothesis that helps to, exp um, um, to define the explanatory project of determining the character of the relevant properties of the separate components of some system. So any kind of sort of theoretical approach to understanding how some complex system works will involve separating the parts and saying what is it about this part and this part that makes them work together in the way they do. Now dispositions come and go. Um, while manifest conditions are extremely local, dispositional pr uh, properties aren't uh, aren't th something that th something has forever or essentially, or they needn't be. Uh, 
Um, and um, a thing may be disposed to acquire or lose a disposition. So we get a kind of hierarchy here, of, a potential hierarchy of, of more complex dispositions which, um, which under, uh, when they have a disposition, they're disposed to get another one or something like that. So the manifestation condition for one disposition might be the acquisition of another disposition. So I once saw a very neat experiment, uh, or um, not experiment, but a demonstration of some properties of super, uh, super cold uh, objects. Uh, you put a banana in a, in a uh, liquid nitrogen thing and super cool it and took it out and dropped, uh, dropped it on the floor. It's, it's, it shattered like a glass. Okay, so um, a banana normally is not fragile, but it is disposed to become fragile and therefore disposed to shatter when dropped uh, if it's super cooled. An ice sculpture is disposed to shatter uh, when dropped, so it's fragile, but it also, uh, it's also disposed to melt more slowly when heated, and, and when it's heated, it loses its fragility, as well as its shape and various other um, properties which are um, not far from being dispositional properties themselves. Now, the finkishness of dispositions in a certain contrived situation, uh, that is the phenomenon that, is demon uh, that demonstrates the inadequacy of the simple conditional analysis, is just one kind of example of the complex interaction of dispositional properties. So the general pattern of a thinkish disposition is something like this. Property D1 is the property of being disposed to uh, manifest property M in condition T. That's the, that's the, uh, the disposition of being a live wire. Um, D2, a second dispositional property, is the property of being disposed to lose D1 under the same test condition, the condition of being, or at least uh, the, the imminence of the uh, test condition comes a little bit before. Um, so D1 is a finkish disposition, to, this is the more abstract characterization, um, D1 is a finkish disposition of an object that is all, if it also has a dispositional property D2, the property to be disposed to lose the first disposition. In the standard examples, the D2, as in the Fink, uh, C.B. Martin's example, D2 is an, ex, uh, an extrinsic property, not an intrinsic uh, property. It's something outside that's detached uh, to the live. Um, wire, but it could be a separate but still intrinsic dispositional property. Finkishness, along with other patterns of interaction, there are lots of examples in the dispositional literature of different kinds of you know, masking properties and antidote properties for dispositions like being poisonous and so on. Um, um, uh, um, so these other patterns show that the stability and independence uh, conditions that the, the dispositional hypotheses are aiming at is, um, is relative and defeasible. So you can lose this, the independence if you're put in a certain kind of situation. Uh, when a disposition D1 is finkish, then the test condition and the property are not, uh, uh, are not uh, because of the fink, independent. But the notion of counterfactual independence still plays an essential role in the characterization of dispositions. It's essential to an example of a finkish disposition that uh, the two dispositional properties, the D1 and the D2, uh, the disposition to do it, the disposition to take away the first disposition, are independent of each other, at least in the sense that it makes sense to suppose counterfactually that the thing has the one property, but not the other. Uh, if you try to construct an example of a finkish disposition where the two, D1 and D2, the two dispositions are realized in the same underlying property, then it won't 
uh, it won't work. You won't be able to find it. Now, okay, so that's, um, um, that's the general uh, uh, remarks about, uh, about dispositions, about the general, about the strategy of trying to develop a particular theory for a particular context uh, in which you talk about dispositional properties. And so now I want to look at um, the kinds of a very uh, special um, condition, uh, namely, uh, about, I mean, a particular kind of application where one might carry on this kind of uh, explanation of what the dispositions are. That's the, um, the kind of structure that represents a, a decision situation. So you can see a game is a representation of a complex um, interaction. Um, the game might involve some chance moves. It might be that you flip coins or you deal cards at certain stages where the, where the, dial the uh, chances of the various hands that you get in the, in the cards are uh, sp what known and specified uh, in defining the game. And then the players get their hands or uh, whatever they get and they then make various moves in sequence responding to each other's, um, uh, other's actions. So you have an interactive process which is again in the, what the game theory provides is a very highly idealized representation of this interactive um, structure. Uh, in trying to articulate that structure and to explain the causal interaction, uh, one, um, one, uh, one way to do it is to introduce um, various dispositional properties which will be manifested when uh, the time for action occurs. So an agent or a, a, a bunch of uh, a, a, class of uh, agents, set of uh, finite set of agents in a game, each have various dispositional properties. Uh, and the dispositional properties they have will be of several different kinds. And, and one of the things I want to do is look at the, in the final part of this, is to look at the relationship between different kinds of dispositional properties of an agent that go into explaining uh, why the agent does what he or she does. So uh, in characterizing a decision problem, you give degrees of belief, beliefs and credences, numerical or measure, measurable uh, propositional attitudes, uh, both of uh, quantified, quantized versions of belief and quantized versions of, of desire or value, valuing mo motivational uh, states. Um, probability represented in the formal theory by probabilities and utilities, and those should be thought of as dispositional properties. When, you move, when we move to, from the um, extensive form of a game represented by the tree structure that shows in time the interaction of, uh, of agents to the uh, more abstract but simpler strategic form of the game, uh, we are moving to a more um, uh, disposition, uh, to a, a more extensive dispositional account of uh, of the uh, the relevant features of uh, of the game, the people and the chance uh, moves that, that get made. So the idea of the strategic form intuitively is that the way in a in a in the idealization, the way that everybody is disposed to behave at the beginning of the game will uh, determine what they do as the game proceeds. That is, um, they have dispositional properties at the beginning and those are successively manifested uh, or not. Some of them are not manifested, but um, uh, the, when the circumstances arise, um, that will have an effect on altering the dispositions in that when you learn new things, uh, you believe uh, new things. Uh, your credences change in the course of a game, but the idealized theory assumes that 
the way your beliefs change in the course of a game are determined by your dispositions to change your beliefs in certain ways, namely by conditionalization, at least in the case where the thing you learn is compatible with uh, what you uh, previously assigned probability one to. So you have a kind of assumption of conditionalization, which is a, um, which is a, um, a hypothesis about how attitudes for a rational agent, for a fully rational agent, change in the course of a situation where one of the events that happens is the, is the requiring of, of, of evidence. Games make highly constraining assumptions which, in the original game theory, which once you get an account of the kind of models of games we have, and once we've introduced beliefs, structures, and, and probabilities into in the game theory, it allows for further generalization. In the game theory as it is, in all the standard games, uh, it's assumed that uh, utilities stay the same throughout the game. The utilities come at the end. So the utilities are, th you sort of, you play your game and then you get a payoff at the end. But um, realistically, you can have a situation where the values that you have may change in the course of the game. And if, uh, if one had some kind of systematic theory of how they change, then, um, then you could introduce that. And the fact is that in Bayesian decision theory does give us a systematic mathematical precise theory of how rational belief changes as one receives evidence, um, but we don't have any theory about how values change. So the assumption is the values remain the same. Um, and there are various artificial ways of trying to introduce changes of utilities, but um, um, uh, you could do it more, more, uh, more directly. And I think this actually, if one actually looks at some of the potential applications of game theory, ways in which beliefs change be very important for strategic reasoning. If you think in general what goes on in a, in a negotiation, in a strategic interaction, uh, in a discussion, or even just the interaction between people walking down the street. I mean, that you, uh, there's a tendency, this is a purely empirical speculation, but it seems there's a tendency for you to think of the people you're interacting with as friends or foes. That is a game where you're, there's lots of common interest is uh, got a certain stability to it and where there's a certain pure conflict of interest, the game has a certain uh, stability to it. And we tend to gravitate toward those things. So as you interact, um, if you are my friend, if you cooperate, or you help me, then I have a tendency to reciprocate. Now part of the reciprocation in games is familiar and explainable in the resources of the theory because um, there's tit for tat kind of strategies where I may, uh, I may punish you in the future uh, because you punished me in the past. And so there can be a strate purely strategic reason for changing your, for, um, for cooperating in a situation with which, a person with which you have conflict. But it also can happen that I am less inclined to take your values seriously as things that I should respect if I regard you as my enemy, right? And if you cross me on a, and people want revenge, uh, they want revenge, they want to hurt someone for its own sake because, uh, because I tend to go to a more sum zero kind of way of thinking. So uh, there's psychological reasons which might be partly explained by the dynamics of, um, of value, valuation, uh, which go beyond the 
strategic, simple strategic uh, form of, of reasoning. But in any case, the idea is one has interaction here and one wants to explain the interaction in terms of the dispositional properties allowing for the fact the dispositional properties themselves are subject to change because there are dispositions to acquire and change dispositions in systematic ways. Um, before getting to looking at the, at the game, uh, the idea of a strategy, I wanted to introduce one um, further structural property of dispositions related to Finkishness, uh, which, will, uh, which will come up. So here's a kind of property of a feature of a, of a complex dispositional situation. Imagine that we have a system, electrical system with a fuse, and in addition, a backup fuse. The first fuse is disposed to break the circuit, as fuses do, when the circuit is overloaded, so the test condition is overloaded uh, circuit, too much uh, current. Um, um, the, the manifest condition is uh, breaking uh, uh, the circuit. The second, uh, uh, the second fuse, the backup fuse, is disposed to break the circuit if it's overloaded and the first uh, fuse fails. So imagine two fuses wired in, in series where the second fuse will never be broken, assuming the first one works. But still, these are separate things, so one can understand this uh, complex structure even though the whole system is set up so the second um, dis dispositional property is never uh, never manifested because the test condition is never uh, met. But uh, since everything is defeasible, you can imagine it could happen that the first one would fail. A second example of this kind of structure, consider a slow-acting vaccine that's disposed to protect the patient, this is a very ineffective vaccine, protect the patient against the fast-acting killer virus. Um, the virus is disposed um, to kill the patient before the vaccine takes effect. But the vaccine is disposed to prevent the, um, uh, to, to prevent the uh, patient from dying on the assumption that the virus doesn't kill the patient right away. So we have, again, two, um, two dispositional properties, one of which is manifested only if the other one fails. Um, okay, again, it's essential to the existence of this kind of pattern that these two properties be in some way independent of each other, in that one can understand what it would be for the thing to have the one but not the other, or for the one to work and the other one not to. Okay, now the games I talked about last time were interactive sequences, um, um, and we make the move to the strategic form, represented by a matrix, uh, which is, represents the situation as understood before the game starts. And the idea is that if the game were to be played out in real time with the actual interaction, if the, assuming the agents are perfectly rational, will change their behavior uh, in, the, in the way in which um, the disposition suggests, the rational disposition suggests they will, then the outcome of a rational choice in the strategy situation will be the same as the situation would be if the game were, were played out. Um, um, so uh, we represent uh, uh, the dispositional properties of the players at the start of the game. Uh, I mean, you can think of them as dispositions which actually are manifested, uh, not in the playing of the game by handing the referee the, the strategies, but rather by actually just playing it out in, uh, in real time. Now, in our models of the game, the types of the player, um, that is, we define the dispositional properties of the player with their types by, um, by saying what their 
and prior beliefs are, and perhaps also what their dispositional uh, or what their belief revision policies are, which are again another kind of disposition which extends conditionalization. So you can say, suppose you learned something which in fact has probability zero for you. Suppose you were to learn, you assign probability zero to some proposition. That is, you say, I I I'm certain that my opponent will not choose option L. Uh, and then it turns out my opponent does choose option L, to my surprise, and I learn it. So now I have to revise my beliefs, and I can't conditionalize because I assign probability zero to this. But, but I can have belief revision policies, perhaps represented by a lexicographic, more extend, extended probability system. Uh, I can have pro um, um, uh, uh, properties, belief revision properties, which tell me what, how, I, how I change my beliefs when I learn this surprising um, information. Um, okay, so the beliefs and desires are, and the belief revision policies are uh, a certain kind of mental disposition, but a strategy um, is a different uh, kind of dispositional property. So um, a strategy is thought of as a kind of conditional intention. So strategies are not identified with uh, something that has to do with utility. Utilities and probabilities motivate you to choose a strategy. They motivate you to make a plan, uh, a contingency plan, perhaps, to do certain things under certain conditions. But um, simply having a desire, uh, even, that is, for something to have much higher expected utility than something else, is not itself um, by definition, it isn't a decision to do that other thing. So the idea of but decision theory is that an action, while it's motivated and perhaps even determined by your probabilities and utilities, if you're rational, it's itself, um, it's itself something um, conceptually independent of this. So the two very different kinds of dispositional properties that play a role in, in a, a unfo unfolding decision theoretic situation. You have, uh, you have the things that make your decisions rational or not, namely, according to the theory, namely the values that you're trying to, uh, trying to achieve. And there are, uh, and then there are the decisions which either are rational or not, but it's essential to the game situation that you have the capacity to do any of the things, to perform any of the actions that are available, to follow any of the branches from the point, choice point uh, that, that you reach. So a strategy is a complex intention. It represents conditional intention what will you do if this choice point is reached? What will you do if that choice point is reached? And so on. So um, to have a strategy is to be disposed to act in those ways. Now even if there's a very clear distinction between what you want and what you do in a, at the moment of choice. So you say, I, I I've, I'm deliberating and I, I figure out that the rational thing to do is to choose option L rather than R, uh, and then I say, therefore, I do it. And that's a further move. But forming an intention which brings with it a belief, that is normally, that is if you intend to do something, then you believe that you will do it. Uh, and yet, uh, um, you can form an intention, and, and that is not a decision. That is, that's, not, uh, that's not doing it. 
right? That's only because maybe it's in the future that you will, um, you will execute your, your intention. So an intention falls somewhere between a kind of property that you find yourself with. I mean, you say pa beliefs and, and attitude are in some way kind of passive. They're there. They're there. I notice that I have these beliefs and values. Um, but actions are things you do. And uh, you, uh, there's an epistemological connection, which is central here, which is that in the case of intention and decision, you know what you do in virtue of deciding to do it. So I don't have evidence. If I say, I'm looking at the thing and say, am I going um, gonna to have um, a ham sandwich or, or, or a, um, a salad uh, at lunch, and I, I know that I'm going to have the ham sandwich because that's what I've decided to do. Right? And, and I, didn't, I don't have evidence that that's what I'm going to do. I have a decision. So it's sort of very em emphasized by philosophers like Elizabeth Anscombe and Stuart Hampshire and David Velleman later and others, that, that uh, a distinction between knowledge by decision and knowledge by discovery. Both uh, play an epistemological um, role, but forming a plan about what to do in the future is decision-like, but defeasible in that it's subject to execution when the time, uh, time comes. And so there's special properties of that. But a, a strategy is a kind of conditional uh, intention. OK, so I wanted to make um, just a connection between the notion um, of a strategy and one of these uh, complex properties that, are, uh, that arise in the interaction of, of uh, dispositions. And this is on the, I mean, uh, before we get to that, let me just say, um, uh, if you have a notion of strategy, you can, you can uh, define, or you have a, a model for a game, you can define uh, rationality in several different ways, some more uh, stronger, some stronger than uh, one stronger than, than the other. You can define a, uh, a player's play in the game as being rational if every action they take is rational. So you can first of all define the rationality of an action. It maximizes expected utility. The, um, the uh, property of um, uh, a, a whole game, a player in a game, is rational if the player, every choice the player makes is rational. But a stronger notion, that's sort of what Robert Allman called material rationality, substantive rationality is uh, the property not only is every choice you make rational, but every choice you would make would be rational, every counterfactual choice. So you can imagine a situation where where um, somebody's drunk at the party and I take their car keys away so that they can't drive home. This person is uh, such that they would have, being no longer fully rational, they would have driven home uh, drunk if they had had their car keys. But I perform a preliminary action in the game, namely taking the car keys away, uh, removing the option that the other player has of driving home. So it turned out the other player was rational in the material sense. Everything they did was rational, but um, they weren't substantively rational because they would have done something irrational if they had had the chance. So you might think of this person as having a strategy, which was drive home if I can, a conditional intention to drive home if I can, that occasion didn't arise. That node of the tree didn't, uh, wasn't uh, reached. Um, so therefore, the person was prevented from, being, from acting irrationally, irrationally, but not thereby from being irrational in the stronger sense. OK, now, in that light, we can make a distinction uh, between um, two ways, two things that might explain why 
you don't reach a certain node of the tree. So um, it might be that you don't reach it because the other players don't make the moves which would take you there. So I say, I don't know for sure whether I'm going to get to this point because I don't know whether earlier moves in the game will allow me to make a certain choice. But you also can be in a situation where I know by decision by my, that I am not going to reach a certain node of the tree. So that, just to illustrate um, the example, and this is the, the one bit of graphics that I managed to get into the handout. Um, we have uh, two moves. This is just, a, just to illustrate the point. Um, Think of this as a one-player game. Um, and this is the utilities that are achieved. Um, by each move. OK, now there are, in this game, four strategies. There's the strategy, choose L1 from this node and choose L2 from that one. There's a strategy L1, R2, R1, L2, R1, R2. The first two strategies I mentioned are purely counterfactual strategies. They are strategies that say, choose this, in which case you yourself know by decision you're not going to reach this point. But a full strategy still has to answer the question, what would you do if you did reach that point? Um, so one distinguishes a strategy, a full strategy of this kind from a plan. A plan is like, uh, there are only three plans, choose L1, that's the end, or choose R1, L2, or choose R1, R2. So a plan is a sort of truncated strategy that eliminates the purely counterfactual ones, the things you know by decision you're not going to do. So the idea of deciding what to do if you don't do what you're going to decide is what you need to do to have a full strategy. So this is the observation is that this has the pattern of the backup views. Right? It has the pattern that um, um, here you have an element, a dispositional property, a dispositional dis conditional decision, which will be reached only if your dispositions overall are not uh, reached. So. Um, uh, first disposition to choose L1, second disposition to choose um, R2 if you reach this, uh, this point. Um, so I might ask, what, what point would there be in having full strategies rather than simply plans? And it's connected with the issue with the dispositional property. You have these kind of patterns of disposition only if the things are somewhat independent of each other. If you want to reduce rationality to the rationality of individual actions, then you need to think about strategies. So if one asks, suppose the agent cho chose L1, was that a rational choice? And the answer might be, well, that depends on what the person would do if they had chosen R R1. Because the person who chooses L1 over R1 is saying, what's the expected utility of this? And what's the expected utility of that? And in order to determine the expected utility of that, you have to answer what's the expected utility, uh, 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 what's the probability of this different, different choice? So you say, suppose the agent says, the reason I chose L1 is because if I had chosen R1, I would have chosen L2. So I got one rather than zero. And I say, why would you have chosen L2? I say, well, that would have been irrational. But that doesn't make this action rational. It makes only this action rational. So if you're interested in trying to explain the rationality of an agent in terms of the individual choices, 
then, um, uh, then you want to talk about pure, uh, full uh, strategies. But a more straight, uh, sort of natural way of thinking about it is to say what you're doing at a, at a point like this is making a choice of, uh, of a plan. And a plan is rational because you, should, you, know, you can now decide what you would do at this point. You don't have to just predict what you're going to do at this point. You can decide. So if you're at this point and you're deciding that you're going to choose this, then you're making an irrational judgment at that point. So you can say there are three plans, this, this, and that. This is the best one, this is the second best one, and this is the third best one. But um, 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 therefore, it would be irrational to choose this one rather than, uh, rather than that one. So, there are examples in the philosophical literature about um, uh, cases where, I mean, there's the famous example of the procrastinating professor who was asked to review a book, and the best choice is to accept and then review it. The second best choice is to decline, and the third worst choice is to accept the review and never do it. And the professor says, well, you know, I'm really never going to do it. So the rational thing to do is to uh, reject, uh, uh, to decline uh, uh, the review and saying, well, I would be irrational uh, or morally weak or something if I made this other choice. So there's a rationality involved somewhere, but not this choice. This choice is the right one to make. So those are the kinds of situations. Where, so there's a, just a general point. There's a connection here then between, uh, first of all, the, whether you should think of yourself and your future and your planning uh, as an agent deciding not just what to do now, but what my overall uh, uh, situation is. Uh, or should you think of your, your future self as another agent, as, a, as a, something subject to prediction? Realistically, you should be somewhere in between. But the game theory idealization um, assumes uh, uh, and this doesn't make it um, accurate, but it also doesn't make it a wrong kind of idealization too, because it helps to bring out um, the issue of, um, 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 of uh, the role of this distinction between decision and prediction. It's clear enough in this case that if this were a second agent, where we have a common interest and the other agent also is going to get two this way and zero that way, then my first decision is based on a prediction about the other agent. I think the other agent will act irrationally, therefore I should, it, the rational thing for me to do is, is, is to, do, uh, to do that. But if it's you yourself who's the other agent, then it's not so clear how to think about um, the problem. Okay, well, um, I... Um, I manage to run um, overtime every day now, I guess, but um, um, uh, uh, for that reason, maybe I'll, I'll stop. Thank you. So. Thank you. Uh, yeah, that's just just sort of clarification. Or uh, so. What, so what, what would you say if? Uh, so it seems to me that in many more realistic cases, uh, when 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 you have a strategy, uh, most of the time you lack information about uh, some of the nodes. Yeah, I mean, yeah. We don't know exactly what are the payoff or what what you know what exactly is the choice. That uh, but you might have. Uh, like uh, uh, still an idea of uh, the possible paths, right? uh -huh. uh, and um, so this is maybe it's going to be a little bit confused, but I, I don't know. It seems to me that then isn't in that case uh, uh, the evaluation of the alternative plans uh, as partial uh, paths, as, as you describe them. Uh, 
more useful for evaluating the, the overall rationality rather than to 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 see the um, I mean the whole situation has a strategy mm -hmm. in, in in your terminology. So, I, I, so probably the question is the following: I wasn't I didn't really understand why uh, considering plans uh, is worse than considering the whole strategy um, in order to evaluate the rationality mm -hmm. of the action. Uh, I mean, given that uh, you, uh, I mean, given that, mm, uh, I'm not saying co considering individual plans, but comparing different plans. Mm -hmm. So I, I didn't get exactly the difference between the two, and in particular when, when, when there is a like, lack of information, it seems to me that intuitively maybe, uh, we tend to compare plans rather than look at the whole strategy. Yeah, but yeah. okay, this. Yeah, good. Okay, so again, the um, the issue about uncertainty about the future is um, I mean, some of the idealizations and, and simplifications that the theory makes. One makes because wasn't it's much more difficult to figure out how to theorize about without them. But in this case. It's, it's really an, no reason why the game can't be, ex, the theory can't be extended to allow for um, uncertainty, not just about um, um, what someone else will do in a certain situation, but um, doubts about what game we're playing. So what the options are. So it might be that only, um, only later will I discover um, um, that um, if I did something, I will have certain options later. And, uh, and you can represent that in a, in a, I mean, one of the problems with the original version of game theory was that it, it didn't have probabilities except objective ones. So the way you modeled uncertainty about the game was by saying, well, let's suppose there's a chance move that starts things off. This is you're playing this game or this game or that game, and um, you don't know um, where you are in the tree because you don't know the result of the chance move. But you say, but it isn't a chance. But of course, if it's a chance move, it means everybody's got to have the same beliefs about it. But it could be that neither one of us know exactly what game we're playing and you have your reasons for not knowing and I have mine. So, so but a, a, a more general theory should allow for lots of uncertainty about uh, what options you will have in the future. But um, there are two kinds, the kind of uncertainty that's much more difficult to model is where I don't have a clear idea what the alternatives are, that it might be uh, what's going to happen. So, but at least you could, mo you could, without too much difficulty, model a theory where um, I know, I mean, I'm, in situ I'm going to be in situation A or situation B or situation C, I just don't know which, something like that. And if you were in that situation, then a, a plan, in the technical sense of plan, would have to tell what to do in each of the possible situations that would arise. So the only sort of peculiarity of the strategy that distinguishes it from a plan is you make decisions about things that you know won't happen, and furthermore, you know they won't happen because you have decided they won't happen. So in, the, in this game, um, you get to choose whether you're going to have the second choice or not. And so if you say, I'm going to make the first choice so that I don't have the second choice, and then I'm going to tell you what I would do if I were at the second point. So that's a, uh, okay, again, it's like the disposition which um, never will be uh, manifested. You can have a situation where it's the other player who makes the second choice, and I, am subjectively certain that the other player won't, will make a certain choice, and then it turns out I'm wrong. So that's why 
uh, you in a in a game you want to decide uh, you want to have a contingency plan even for cases that you're sure won't arise so long as it's at least possible that, that they do arise because then you just as you're disposed to change your beliefs if you're surprised so you're disposed to behave in certain ways if you're if you're surprised but I don't know if I'm getting at your worry here but, uh, I mean, probably my worry was that, so, so if the point is to, so that if you lack information, it looks like that uh, uh, it might be difficult to understand what, what is the strategy that you, that, that you think more rational. Uh -huh. Whereas it might be easier to think, oh, there are, you know, those possible plans, I don't know exactly which one, you know, which situation we will be find myself, but uh, I know that, you know, I could do, uh, you know, this, this uh, sequence of action or this other, you know, mm -hmm. probably, uh, well, maybe I will find myself in a completely new situation, so I don't know what to do, but, and then, okay, if I, you know, if I have uh, this set of choices, uh, then, you know, uh, I, I, for instance, I can rule out certain ones as not rational or, or, mm -hmm. or uh, mm -hmm. not good for some other reason. And, and, and then, I mean, it seems to me that in this case, then, uh, I mean, if I, um, so it's like that if, you know, I, maybe at a certain point I, I realize that then there is a general strategy that I can follow. Mm -hmm. But I might, you know, I might not know it before, while I think that it's easier, it, would, it might be easier for me to know more or less what are the plans that I could, uh, yeah, I yeah. could apply. That, so that's, and, and so it seems to me that it's, it's I mean, uh, when you have an idea of the possible plan, uh, that's enough to know what would be the rational way to do, I mean, the, the, the what, 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 no, which one are rational and which aren't, uh, even if I don't have an idea of the general strategy. Whereas I, I thought that you want to say that you can't really have an, uh, an evaluation of the rationality if uh -huh. there is no general strategy. And, and, I, uh, and I thought that, uh, so I wasn't, I wasn't sure of that because it's, it's, I thought that when, when there is uncertainty, Sometimes we don't have an idea of the strategy, but we still have an idea of what the plans, yeah, possible plans yeah. are. There. So that's I mean, in the case of extreme uncertainty, um, realistically, you just got to wait and see, right? So, I mean, I say, look, here's two doors. You can choose which one to go in. Each one, there's this complicated game you're going to be given. Um, um, and uh, I'm not going to tell you now what the game is or something like that. And a uh, complicated sequence of moves and you know, all. And um, maybe I tell you enough so that you can say, well, I think it's a, bit, a little more likely that the whole scenario that plays out if I take door one will be better than door two. And I say, what are you going to do then? I have having the faintest idea, you know, I don't have a plan. I'll only get my plan when you tell me more at the next stage. So there certainly are games where you don't get to find out very much. Until you, you get to find out a little bit, but not very much until you... And of course you can't then have, you can't think of all the different things. That, that's why the strategic form is, is computationally completely unrealistic for any complicated game, is that um, you can't sort of lay out all the possible things that might happen for all you know, and make a plan for each one. That's what a full strategy or a full plan would have to be. Uh, but that's why I think it's important to think of the plan not as, uh, I mean, as a, a kind of dispositional thing. It's, it's what you are disposed to do. And then that's part of the problem with um, separating um, passive dispositions from active ones is that it, Maybe you're disposed to behave in certain, to make certain choices, uh, 
but um, you can't you can't articulate it because you don't know enough about uh, about the situation to come. So I think the situation of ignorance of what choices you're going to have in the future um, is um, um, a complicating uh, factor that the theory uh, sh should take account of, but it sort of helps to see that the relationship between um, tendencies, if you think dispositions is just ways, think of yourself as an object who's disposed to behave in various ways under various conditions. You know, when the, when the when your um, knee is is uh, tapped, it uh, shakes. You know, I mean, you think of your over, your just more sophisticated things like that. Say, no, that's not quite right. Uh, you want to think of of a, um, of uh, uh, deciding things in virtue of the properties you have. But still, there is this kind of way in which which a choice is is a disposition. And I think they. Um, when the the other relevant properties like beliefs in particular are very uh, impoverished, you don't know very much, then it's much more difficult to, uh, to do. But, you know, I think so one does. And, I, and this is the whole, of course, the, the, the decision theorists and statisticians and economists generally you know, distinguish uncertainty from, from risk. So where risk is a case where you really do have our, some kind of um, stable probability judgments about alternatives which are sort of laid out there. But uh, whereas uncertainty is, is uh, something that can't be, um, can't be represented. You don't, you, you don't know enough about the situation to even have degrees of belief about the alternatives. Uh, and of course, that can change over time. What, what that is, but uh, it's much more difficult to theorize about pure uncertainty. Right? Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Uh, I was wondering if you could uh, say something about the relationship between uh, dispositional properties and possible worlds. Uh -huh. If dispositional properties are part of possible worlds, or they are independent. Uh -huh. Thank you. I mean, to the extent that um, even though you can't give a straightforward, unqualified uh, definition of a dispositional property in terms of counterfactuals, um, there is a, a kind of default um, all of the things equal counterfactual property that's used to explain the disposition. So um, even if the analysis can't be given as a definition, the if if you are subjected to the test condition, you would show the manifestation condition is um, involved in the understanding of the disposition. So uh, one has to think. Uh, if, if you're looking at this object and wondering whether it's fragile, you say, well, I, you know, it's, it's a nice thing, and I don't want to, uh, I want to know whether it's fragile, but I don't, don't want to find out by dropping it. Um, um, so, uh, but why, you know, because if I did drop it and it were fragile, then it would break, right? And I don't want it to break. So, um, so um, I think, on the face of it, even though in a formal analysis you may try to avoid using possible worlds as a, as a uh, analytical resource, you're still, in some sense, inevitably talking about possibilities, non-actual possibilities, when you're talking about counterfactuals. And so possible worlds are involved in that um, limited sense, at least. And um, to that extent, they're also involved then in understanding um, disposition. So, um, despite the taking the point given by the refutation of the counterfactual analysis of dispositions, it still seems to me um, uh, the, the whole family of natural necessity concepts involve 
modalized, modal notions, no, notions having to do with, with uh, not with, I mean, one way to think of it is seeing the world, the actual world, as um, in, a, uh, in a set of alternative possibilities with which, to which it's a fa by factual matter it's related in various different, different ways. So that's the general uh, way in which I think possible worlds come into it. And, uh, Um, there is a puzzle in semantics which is called the imperfective paradox. Uh -huh. uh, I don't know whether you are familiar with it. Uh, it uh, the puzzle is this. Under which conditions um, uh, can we say truthfully that uh, someone is crossing the street? And uh, oh, a okay. natural answer is uh, someone is crossing the street if um, she's engaged in some activity that eventually uh, develops into her getting across. Uh -huh. uh, but we know that this natural answer is um, mistaken because it may be true that someone is crossing the street, although at some point in the middle of the street he gets run over by a car, and so uh -huh. uh, its activity never turns into a right, complete yeah, event yeah. of getting across. Mm -hmm. So so there it seems that uh, an appropriate, appropriate truth conditions would need to uh, make reference to the fact that eventually th the activity manifests itself as a complete event of crossing, uh -huh, uh -huh. And as an event of getting across, but the tr problem is to define under which conditions uh, you know, we, we uh, should uh, which conditions are relevant to um, uh, as conditions under which we would expect that uh, the event turns into a complete crossing. Uh -huh. um, so it seems that it's sort of related to the problem of finkish dispositions in uh -huh. a sense. One of the strategies that is used to uh, um, uh, deal with imperfective paradox is to appeal to partiality, that is to think about possible situation, not worlds, but just a smaller situation, minimal situations in which uh, the person is engaged in uh, uh, the crossing activity uh, and the bus is not part of the situation. Mm -hmm. There's the street and the, and, the, and, the, and the agent. It seems to me that in a sense, uh, in the problem of Finkish disposition, at least in the version of the puzzle that you gave, uh, there's a similar problem. We had to get rid of the uh, electro Fink. Uh -huh. uh, and maybe what one way to do it is to think that um, the disposition has to be manifested in situations that contain just the lie wire and the conductor and uh -huh. not the electro thing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't yeah. know why that, that makes uh -huh. much sense, but... Yeah, good. No, I think that's... Um, I think you're right that there's connection here, and I think... Um, um, and again, I haven't thought about... I mean, I'm familiar with the general idea of that paradox, but... I haven't looked at enough examples to know what uh, uh, w w to say anything about exactly where the lines seem to get drawn. But I think the idea of um, a normal, I mean, all over the place we have assumptions about um, normal courses of events and interventions in them. And those are going to play a role, particularly when you have these kind of interactions where you have something, two kinds of dispositional things, both of which you can say, well, this one, normally things would work out this way, and this one, things would normally work out that way. But when they come together, they can't both be normal, so, uh, so you get these kinds of, kinds of problems. So uh, the idea that um, it's got to be, I mean, I know this is, one might, I don't know if this is the right kind of thing people say, but uh, uh, you can't be crossing the street unless um, normally um, 
you would succeed, you would have succeeded in crossing the street if you, you know, but something intervened uh, uh, to do it. I also don't know, what's interesting is whether, to what extent, um, I, I would suspect just speculation that the, the most robust examples of that kind would be cases of action, where, which were done with intentions. And so one has a clearer idea what the normal course of events would be. Namely, you succeed in doing what you were trying to do. But for all, I mean, uh, there may well be cases which are not intentional at all, but just have to do with physical processes. So maybe, um, um, I mean, whether a, a, a ball was rolling, was, was crossing the street when it got hit by the bus just because it was rolling across, not because somebody was trying to get to the other side. I don't know whether that what to think about those kinds of cases. But no, I think, right, the, so some idea of um, normal uh, versus intervention, I think, is, is, is involved in the dispositional idea, too. And, uh. Ask another question. <laughs> um, always uh, concerning the uh, example of the electoral thing, I, uh, I was wondering whether I mean, the example is constructed in such a way that we uh, know that uh, uh, um, the wire as the disposition of property of being live, right? Uh -huh. uh, but problem is the property is never manifested because of the electro thing. Yeah. yeah. Uh, um, so I, I was wondering whether. Um, The example doesn't tell us, the, the description of the case doesn't tell us uh, why the um, uh, wire as the property, the disposition of property of being live. Uh, but one might think that that has to do with um, something that has um, its internal structure, the way it's made, and mm -hmm. which is the same as the way other wires are made, which mm -hmm. is similar to the way other wires are made, uh, uh, which are in fact live because there's no yeah, yeah, electro yeah. thing uh, around. Uh, so I don't know whether this is the direction that, uh, that Goodman would take because he regarded the notion of similarity as problematic, but uh, um, resemblance as problematic, but. Um, I mean, in a sense, uh, the reason why we are uh, willing to say that uh, the wire is live, uh, although it never manifests its property, doesn't, doesn't that have to do with the fact that the wire has some similarity and resemblance with other live wires? Yeah, good, yeah, yeah. That's the, so if you go back to the idea that um, to, project in the way Goodman had in mind and the way I'm thinking of it, uh, you are you're making an empirical hypothesis that there exists a property. And um, which it's essential that it be in some sense independent of whether it is subjected to the test condition. So, um, um, you're going to then test your hypothesis that there exists such a property by finding related properties um, which are manifested in different ways and which tend to correlate with it or something like that. So, uh, and you know, when people, when people, a lot of people talk about disposition, they talk about finding the categorical base of a disposition. And that's certainly the way Goodman thought about it. He thought we, uh, we, that we now, once we've identified this property by sort of fixing the reference, we go and find out more about it by um, uh, perhaps finding other ways to detect whether it's, it's there, other than, than the one we use to define it, um, or to fix the reference of it. 
Um, and so that is partly a matter, I think, of finding similarities between, um, uh, and with, with the case with, with uh, live wires, I mean, you know, we have a theory about what's going on um, in the wire uh, in the case where it's live. Um, and that theory could be tested in other ways. And so and that, and that, that's, I think you're right to think of it as a kind of similarity between um, the one with the electrofink attached and the one without the electrofink attached. And so the idea that there's some notion, as Goodman said, of intrinsicness, uh, that is, there's something about, something lo localizable in the thing itself, um, uh, and that means if we change the surrounding conditions in lots of ways, it ought to still have it, and uh, do we test for that as, as well? And, and that's, again, a matter of finding similarities between things that have the electrofink on them and things that don't. So, so I think that's right. I think that's the part of the overall strategy of identifying the property and, and explaining how it's possible for it to have the dispositional property without the counterfactual property. While other people think about their question, I'm, I have a follow-up question on the thing you were discussing. Uh, because now you are saying that concerning dispositional properties, you are looking for intrinsic properties uh -huh. and similarity between um, intrinsic properties had by similar object, mm -hmm. but uh, I thought that you were discussing and Lewis because he was assuming intrinsic properties as essential properties and uh, uh, the similarity relation when he were considering counterfactuals while as I understood you were considering relational properties as essential and, and, and you were not looking for the similarity relation but you were looking for this projection mm -hmm. idea. Now with the dispositions you seem to go back to a Lucian approach namely intrinsic properties and similarities and relations. I wanted you to say something about this. Good. So, um, it's the question, the distinction between intrinsic properties and relational properties is, um, itself somewhat problematic in a way. A dispositional property is um, essentially um, related to other properties that the things don't necessarily have, but uh, and and um, so um, there's a conceptual connection between being, um, having a disposition to, to shatter and shattering, mm -hmm. but things that don't shatter at all. So the, the idea is that the shattering uh, involves a relation um, between uh, the object and the rest of the world that it's, in, it's behaving in. Um, something has to happen to it, go through a process. But one is trying to sort of reach back to find an intrinsic property that um, plays a role in explaining what it does in other situations, so what, how it interacts with other things, or how it relates to other things. Um, David Lewis's intrinsic, purely natural properties are, it was important for his project that they be defined, in, that, well not defined, but that they, their nature be such as to be uh, independent 
of any of these connections and relations to other things in the world. So you say, well, in a sense, a dispositional property is like a relational property in that it's essentially connected with, um, not just contingently, but by its nature, with the way it, it behaves when it interacts with other things which also have uh, properties. So the explanation for why something shatters is not just fragility, it's, it's also, um, you know, the hardness of the floor and, and uh, the, um, the laws and the rest of it. So, um, so pinning down this notion of intrinsicness, I think, is, I think uh, to try to do it Lewis's way, uh, you get these, then you, you wind up with some kind of mysterious um, inner core of a property that, uh, that doesn't uh, connect essentially with anything, and I think that's... Uh, but I don't know if I'm getting at what you're... Yeah, yes. I, I think that there is a difference between uh, the way you see the intrinsic properties, and what Lewis says is that the intrinsic properties are, namely properties which are possessed by an object independently of any relation the object has with anything else. So, um, mm -hmm. but when you talk of dispositions and uh, you are saying that there are certain properties uh, which are possessed by an object, um, And what we are saying that those properties are relational properties, even if they do not manifest themselves. I, it is not real clear what it is. Uh -huh. yeah. uh, uh, I was trying to. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, of course, now I don't. Um, I don't want to rest anything on a distinction between intrinsic. I mean, I think there's sort of a kind of rough intuitive idea of, of um, the property itself as opposed to uh, se trying to separate features of the world in a way. They say, well, we want to locate a certain aspect of the explanation for how things are behaving in this complex hurly-burly of reality, uh, of, of inter interactive processes, and so on. We want to locate so an explanatory component uh, in each of the things that are involved in this. And this is sort a of way of thinking of, of the interaction as the interaction of objects, where objects have an identity of a kind. But uh, I think the task of identifying the intrinsic properties um, of the object, trying to define what it means for a property to be intrinsic, is not an easy task, and I'm not sure, I mean, I want to, it may be one should do it in different ways for different purposes, but, uh, so I didn't want to rest anything on that, on that distinction. So is it really intrinsic being um, fragile? Now, I don't think all dispositions are intrinsic in even in the ordinary sense, but, um, but you might ask, um, suppose uh, not only I mean, suppose by law of nature, every, um, every live wire is connected with an electrofink or something like that. I mean, there's some sort of deep explanation for why these two things have to go together. Um, would it still be um, fragile? You might want to say, well, that would be a world where the intrinsic properties, of, or would it still be live? And, uh, the intrinsic properties of the wire remain the same, but Deep differences in the rest of the world uh, are different. Um, uh, does that show that you know it's not an intrinsic property of the wire? It's, it's live. I don't think so. I mean, I think it. it uh, um, if, you, if you're Lewis, maybe you want to have these properties that could survive any change in the world other than changing this one thing or something like that. But I'm not sure there's a clear idea of that. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so, so I think the very distinction is one you want to make in a kind of relative uh, way. 
And we just take the, the dispositional property being observable. Um, imagine a world where um, the observing creatures have a radically different perceptual system than we have. Well, and then um, they can pick up certain things we can't pick up and can't pick up certain things we do. And, uh, um, I mean, or even in the world, dogs can perceive things um, by smell, um, which um, human beings can't. Um, um, things, some creatures hear things. Is it really hearing? You know, and all that. So, um, I think uh, a property like observable seems, in some way, very much um, defined in terms of of um, what's normal for other things in the environment, um, and, and so it's not really a, an intrinsic um, property. But um, beyond the sort of general idea that one wants to kind of locate the part of the task of bringing some order to our theory of the world is trying to um, locate parts, things, entities with some kind of robust character where, where um, it's easy to distinguish, at least given the environment we're in, um, the properties being really located in the thing in some, in some intuitive sense, and how much that only works because the rest of the world is a certain way. I mean, that, that's, uh, but, but so that's the very general task, but it doesn't yield, I think, a really sharp notion of an intrinsic property. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Uh, I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about the uh, underlying metaphysics, because I think I got a little bit lost with the role of dispositions in the picture. So, With the role of? A dispositions, dispositional yeah, properties. Yeah, okay. So where does the buck stop in terms of maybe, let's say, what's fundamental or what's primitive? So we've got talk of counterfactuals, we've got talk of dispositional properties, talk of laws of nature and things like that. And you might think that if you take the laws and plug in how things are, you get dispositional properties being a kind of emergent thing, like just you know the macroscopic, uh, sorry, microscopic features of a, a vase plus the laws of nature. From that, you get the fragility of the vase. Mm -hmm. But that's presupposing that we have an account of laws of nature before we get the dispositions. Uh, if we're analysing counterfactuals in a kind of Lewisian possible world way, we have the laws, and then we analyse the counterfactuals based on the laws and the things at the worlds. Mm -hmm. Again, dispositions don't enter into the picture there until quite late in the story. But for you, I was thinking dispositions seem to be a bit more primitive than that. Uh, maybe we can use dispositions to analyze the counterfactuals, use dispositions to analyze the laws. But that's where I think I lost the thread. So could you say a little bit more about the place of dispositions in the metaphysics for you? Good, OK. So yes, so one of the even whether or not Lewis's reductive project works, I think one still can ask some questions about relative priority here, and which of the kind you're asking. And I, I think the tendency to take laws as somehow the most basic notion and first get clear about that. Uh, and if you do that in Lewis's way, which is I think the only way to do it if, you, if you're going to try to do it uh, first without bringing in the rest of the apparatus is, uh, is, is as purely descriptive um, patterns of regularity. And then you say, so what are the things that are regular, are regularly uh, conjoined or connected and so on? And I think um, you say, well, fundamental properties. Um, but not just fundamental properties. I think one starts um, 
at, at, uh, at all different levels and, and uh, with, uh, I mean, often the way one theorizes is to start with relatively superficial observable properties of things in the world, which are um, clearly dispositional. Uh, in a but but very kind of vague way where the lots of these sufficiently you know uh, uh, appropriate you know I mean words like that being built into your your characterization um, so I think the things that are involved in both sort of more surface common sense generalizations and laws. And when you get deeper down into the, into the more fundamental uh, theories, you're developing concepts which are essentially dispositional and in a way more tightly tied to their um, manifestation conditions than the superficial ones are in some ways. And they say like a notion like soluble, uh, the test condition is much Clear, much more explicit, and uh, but soluble is a theoretical disposition. So um, I think while you're looking for generalizations, the generalizations which are sort of the analog of laws when you get to the fundamental level, the 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 things you start with are going to be highly defeasible with lots of weasel words built into them, all of the things being equal and under normal conditions and stuff like that. Um, and then uh, you work to make them more precise and at the very time you're working to make the generalizations more precise you're also sharpening and clarifying the the properties that describe the things that are going to be generalized about so um, I think one doesn't want to think of the laws as more um, uh, sort of separable and prior from the right. The, the, the project has to go um, back and forth between um, individuating properties uh, and generalizing about those uh, properties. And if you don't find any generalizations of, of a defensible, verifiable kind, then you have reason to doubt that you've succeeded in finding the right properties. Or your predicates maybe don't really mean, uh, don't have a reference. And uh, So it's part of the rejection of the reductionist project of Lewis's kind is a, is a rejection of a, a sharp hierarchy of order, conceptual order of explanation and, and much more holistic kind of back and forth. Does that get at the metaphysical? Any other question? So we thank you very much for coming, for giving those very useful lectures for us. We really appreciate it. Thank Great. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you all. And, uh,